Sassler. And we're outside the Sony store at Metreon on this, the very eve of the PlayStation 2 launch. Yes, we're hours away where a few hundred lucky people are hoping to receive a PlayStation 2 on the day of its launch. Yeah, good luck. Yes. Because? Well, due to the fact that there's not that many available right now. No kidding. All these people are staying here all night in the cold and the impending rain. They don't even know if they're going to get one yet. Plus, they had to bring in these PlayStation 2s under very tight security. How tight? Well, tight enough that they have to kill you if I told you. Weird. Well, then, uh, let's take a closer look at the PlayStation 2 and find out what all this fuss is about, what these people are waiting for. <laughs> Demand is high. The hype is huge. The time has arrived. The PlayStation 2 has finally landed on U.S. soil. Only those lucky enough to actually get their hands on one will be able to see if the hardware measures up to the hype. The battle of the next generation consoles has officially begun. There's been tons of speculation about the PlayStation 2 in the past months, even years. We do know this. It's a 128-bit, 300 megahertz game console that also plays CDs and DVDs. And for now, it's the fastest gaming machine on the market. Because of the technology that we've been able to pack into the PlayStation 2, uh, it's going to offer uh, a very compelling uh, gameplay, more depth and character, if you will, more uh, thick story plots because of the memory size that we have really a total emotional experience. When you open your PS2 box, you'll find the sleek black console, of course, as well as one controller, the DualShock 2. Besides the cables and styrofoam, that's about it. If you want to invest in some peripherals, you can buy a multi-tap adapter or an 8 megabyte memory card. As time goes on, other peripherals will be coming from Sony, including a hard drive and an Ethernet connector, allowing gamers to go online. The arrival of the PS2 is the biggest consumer electronics launch in history. Sony hopes to ship 3 million units by March of 2001. So far, they've fallen short of their projected production, however. Sony originally promised that 1 million consoles would be shipped at launch. As it turns out, only half as many are coming ashore. The delay that we've experienced in the PlayStation 2 uh, production was uh, just a, a, a combination of component uh, shortages that, uh, that we unfortunately did not expect. The coming months will show whether or not Sony is able to make up for the production shortfall. Game developers have been hard at work creating games for the new console since its announcement. Certainly with the PlayStation 2, we've been able to, again, pack a lot of technology into it um, and also, therefore, give the uh, software development teams more colors on a palette, um, if you will. The next generation for us as developers is, is extremely exciting. You know, that it's, it's a clean um, sheet of paper. There's, there's nothing there. There's no perception of what can be done. I think the PlayStation 2 is an amazing piece of hardware. I'm having a great time with it. I know that the other pieces of hardware that are coming are also amazing. And um, there'll be things we can do with those that you can't do with the PlayStation 2, and that's okay. That's, that's part of the uh, evolution of gaming. Well, the evolution of gaming has already taken casualties. Some companies have found it very challenging to develop for the PS2. Recently, Oddworld inhabitants decided not to port their new Munch's Odyssey game to the Sony console. When we heard about the Sony platform, that was basically going to be so much faster and so much more realistic and all these wonderful things, you know, we went, well, of course, that's the platform we'd like to be on. But grappling with the uh, inherent problems that one has when they're trying to create work that looks really real and you're working on a console that just really can't deliver the kind of reality we're looking for. A lot of things we thought would be a hell of a lot easier and they're not. Regardless of the problems some developers have had, there's no denying that many of the games launching with the PS2 look stunning. Sony has about a year to establish the PS2 in the American gaming market before more competition arrives. Nintendo and Microsoft are watching carefully as they plan the release of their new machines. Part of Sony's strategy is to sell the PlayStation 2 as more than just a gaming console. With multiple inputs, such as USB and FireWire, providing room for expansion, much more could be in store for this little black box. We're going to have some more information on the future of the PlayStation 2 coming up later in the show. But given the significance of the evening, it would be appropriate for us to address one of the most common questions asked here at GameSpot TV. Which of the next generation console systems is going to be the best? Unfortunately, we can't answer that. 
because we need to have each one in its finished form for us to actually give a true opinion. Right, I mean, you can have the sickest list of hardware specs in the whole world, but it all comes down to the software implementation. Let me put it this way. If you have a top of the line, really expensive force feedback steering wheel, but your game has a bad force feedback implementation, it's not going to be any use to you anyway. And also, one system won't be the best for all people. Certain people like certain types of games that certain systems will specialize in. So don't think that just because the PlayStation 2 is your favorite, that it should be everybody's favorite. Right, so when it comes down to it with all the next-gen consoles, show, show us, us the, the games. games. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we battle Samurais in Medieval Japan in what looks to be one of the most promising strategy sim titles on the PS2. TV in the front of the all-night PlayStation 2 line, and we are here with Paul, who is first. Paul, how's it feel to be first in line? It feels great. You know, I've been uh, waiting for this moment for a few days now, and uh, I just can't wait till PlayStation 2 is ready to be sold to me. All right, so Paul, how long you been here? I've been here since 8.30 last night. And it rained on you? It rained, it was hot, it was cold. I went through it all with me and my buddies. So this is a dedicated man. Now, his buddies were all here since midnight. They are... My name's Nat. Edgar. Rich. All right, guys, so what game are you most looking forward to seeing come out on the PlayStation 2? Cassian! Cassian! Okay, here it is. This battle shall decide the fate of Tokugawa. Attack! If there's one company that knows its strategy simulation games, it's Koei. Their first contribution to the PS2 is Kessen. It's a title that follows in the tradition of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms series, yet doesn't burden the player with the complexities seen in previous Koei releases. Kesen is based during the Shogun era of Japan. You initially take the role of Iyasu Tokugawa, leading your troops to battle against Mitsunari Ishida. When engaged in battle, you can switch from the field map to the battle view. The latter can be fun to watch as the skirmishes are done in real time. Visually, the sight of hundreds of soldiers on a battlefield is awesome, showing that Koei has put the PS2's hardware to good use. Die! The audio elements more than add to the game's epic feel. The dialogue is witty. Fight me if you dare! Take this! The soundtrack is amazing, and the sound effects are realistic. Take this! Kessen will definitely be one for the Japanese history buffs, but because of its relatively easy interface, novice gamers should also take note. This wealth of sonatas. Your life is mine! Well, here we are in line with Albert. We just saw Kessen, which is a strategy game. Do you play many strategy games? Yeah, I like strategy games. They're kind of cool. Yeah, I know that the Kessen's supposed to be a lot easier to play than some of the other Koei strategy games that have been out there. But uh, that's not your favorite type of game, is it? No, it's not really. I like the uh, giant robot like mech fighting games and stuff. Like, and what is behind this? Well, ever since I was little, I used to watch Robotech. I love like anything with big hulking metal things blowing stuff up. Right, and there's a couple of games that are mech oriented that are coming out for the PlayStation 2. There's Armored Core 2 and Gun Griffin Blaze. It's just another day of sweating it out in your favorite mech. Two years after the release of Gun Griffin 2, Game Art's Gun Griffin Blaze is out for the PS2, complete with mechs, non-stop action, and the horrors of a post-apocalyptic global power struggle. The core of your mission entails taking out everything from enemy mechs to helicopters, and the CPU has a more than decent AI, so your maneuvering skills will be put to the test. Complete your tasks and you're rewarded with points that you can use to unlock a slew of secrets from new mechs to alternate level scenarios. Visually, the game excels in quantity. Enemies swarm around you and there is never a shortage of particle and smoke effects. For continuity's sake, the sound effects have been lifted from the previous gun griffins, though the radio banter has been improved upon. Gun Griffin Blaze promises to be both fun and strategic without burdening the player with much realism. Coming up on GameSpot TV, we have football action. We jump on the gridiron with Madden 2001 for the PlayStation 2. And we get radical on the slopes in the awesome PS2 snowboarding title, SSX. Call 
Welcome back to GameSpot TV here, waiting for the PS2 at the Metreon in San Francisco. And joining me right now is Jeffrey. Um, now, there haven't been too many first-person shooter games available on most of the consoles, though I know you have a personal favorite. Yes, uh, I've been looking forward to Time Splitters on uh, PlayStation 2. Um, I have played a lot of uh, 007 on the Nintendo 64. And uh, seeing it's from the same group of programmers, I thought the gameplay on it was, was awesome. Um, yeah. The multiplayer is one of the, one of the greatest things I really like about it. It's great having uh, four people playing on the same time. Um, Yes, it's a good thing, and, and, and it's also being developed by a lot of the people from Rare that did work on GoldenEye. So, without much further ado, let's look at Time Splitters. Time Splitters, a first person shooter, adopts the aesthetics of B movies, which means kooky characters abound. Imagine cop show detectives, aliens, and robots inhabiting places like cathedrals, graveyards, and otherworldly spacecrafts. And you've got this new game for the PS2. The game focuses on multiplayer combat, which allows for some knuckle whitening shootouts. It's not an intellectual game. Time Splitter's levels seem geared towards the mowing down of opponents. Prior to the matches, you and your fellow players select your characters. Player one sets the parameters for the match such as the number of kills needed to win, the weapons and bots present, and the arena in which the battle will take place. The game also includes a level editor. Arenas with up to eight floors can be constructed, and there are a variety of texture sets with which to decorate the arenas. Many things can be tweaked, from weapon availability and bot population to lighting effects. Every console needs a good shoot 'em up game, and Time Splitters provides the PS2 just that. So there was our look at Time Splitters, first person shooter, classic gaming genre. Now let's move on to the fighting genre. Now I'm standing here with my new best friend Richard. Why are you my new best friend Richard? Because we both love DOA too. Oh yes we do. Oh yes we do. Now check it out. Look what he has right here. A blue bracelet. This means he is in fact getting a PlayStation 2. So why do you want DOA 2 hardcore so much? Because they, for one thing they added more polygon counts that make it smoother. Anti-alias is intact. And I love the motion capture demonstrations they did just for PS2. All right, cool. And all the new stages are totally awesome. I've got a bunch of them on tape, so let's take a look right here. Better Alive 2 fans rejoice. Tecmo is hard at work on the hardcore US version. Better Alive 2 Hardcore will feature a whopping 10 unique game modes with everything from an arcade-style story mode to a Tekken-like tag battle mode. The fighting in DOA 2 Hardcore is the same in both the Japanese and US versions. Face buttons are for standard punch kick attacks, including killer combos with the D pad. The shoulder buttons switch out characters in the tag mode. The most remarkable thing about the fighting in DOA 2 is its amazing reversal system. It takes definite finesse to pull off a counter, not a move for the button master. The game sports some gorgeous backgrounds. There are several new arenas, all of which feature interactive environments and multi level fighting. The game features amazing motion, spectacular lighting effects, and plenty of little realistic details. The characters are refined and beautifully rendered. Dead or Alive 2 Hardcore is a definite improvement over the Japanese PS2 version. Anyone who doesn't already have DOA 2 should definitely keep an eye out for this one. Keep your mouth shut! Even if DOA 2 Hardcore is very similar to the Dreamcast version of the game, that doesn't mean that PS2 owners shouldn't have the chance to play it. Now we're being joined by Albert, Mike, and Jeremy, who are real big football fans. So guess what game we're about to talk about. First, what is the football game that you've been playing recently? For PlayStation, Madden 2001, and for Dreamcast, NFL 2K1. And you? Same here. NFL 2K1 for Dreamcast. Yes, now that's a very impressive looking game. But now we have Madden 2001 for the PlayStation 2, which has definitely taken it one step higher. On the whole, Madden 2001 follows the same... Welcome back to GameSpot TV on PlayStation 2 night in San Francisco. As you can see, it's starting to happen. They're letting the people in the doors to finally get the PlayStation 2. So we thought this would be the best moment to look at the launch title that has the greatest buzz around it. That's right. It's a snowboating title. That Unlike is. anything you've ever seen before, check it out, SSX. SSX looks to be the best all-around title to launch with the PS2, period. One of the major differences between SSX and previous snowboarding games is how well SSX balances racing and performing tricks. 
The game awards points and an adrenaline boost for the tricks you do. The adrenaline boost helps you race down the courses faster than you could on your own. This allows the game to be heavy on tricks while still keeping a fast-paced racing game edge. From the game's outset, you can select from four different characters, each of which has a different persona and boarding style. Progressing through the game by finishing in the top three of every course in the preliminary, semi-final, and final events unlocks more tracks, borders, special boards, and outfits. Let's get it on! The first two tracks are pretty standard. After that, things can get crazy. Tracks range from a run through a snow-covered city at night to a desert setting. The game gives you the freedom to explore the vast levels, which is how you find the hidden shortcuts that are almost necessary in order to finish in first place. Graphically, SSX is one of the most dynamic PS2 titles. The people in the game look like anime characters, and the textures used for the clothes and environments are rich and detailed. In the end, SSX is a very cool snowboarding game. Every element comes together and makes for a game that you'll want to play again and again. We had a chance to play SSX, and I will tell you, it is a total blast, and also probably the closest I am ever going to get to actual snowboarding. Okay, as you can tell by all this noise behind us, we are just moments away from all these folks being able to get in and get those PlayStation 2s. So in the meantime, let's take a look at the intro of the week. The moment of truth is imminent. I'm sitting up here at the front of the line with Nat. How are you doing? I'm doing fine, Adam, but I'm a little tired. Yes, I can understand that. You've been sitting out in the rain, you've been sitting here, you've been jumping through flaming hoops, but are you ready? Do you have your money? Yes, I do. I brought $462, and 40 of it is in change in this bag right here with me. All right, they're, they're really going to love you in the Sony store when you pull that out. Well, we've seen what the PS2 is all about right now, but there's a lot more to come. Let's look at the future of the PlayStation 2. With the wait thankfully over and the PlayStation 2 finally here in America, it might seem like overkill to ask what the future has in store for the newest game console on the block. But Sony does have plans. We wanted to make sure that the PlayStation is number one, uh, very future-proof uh, in terms of uh, you know how people enjoy their software, whether it's packaged media or whether it's through uh, some sort of network connectivity or downloads. Well, what does this mean exactly? The American PlayStation 2 will come with an open space in the back, a bay. This is for the addition of two peripherals available in the future, a hard disk drive and a broadband adapter. There are some uh, applications or some entertainment genres that inherently lend themselves to an online environment. And that would be, for example, uh, exchanging information real time with the people that you're playing games with. In other words, you can deathmatch with multiplayer shooter titles like Quake and Unreal Tournament, among other things. But when combined with the storage capabilities of the hard drive, new opportunities open up, such as with the 11th installment of the Final Fantasy series, which is being developed to be entirely online and played in real time. The storage space also opens up new horizons to keep your gaming rather timely. Uh, receiving real-time information in terms of news or, for example, stats on your football game to really uh, uh, renew or update what you have in your system. Another use for the hard drive will be episodic games, as with the future Tomb Raider title. In this case, after the basic game disc is bought, new levels and adventures will become available for download to expand and extend its play. Even without the internet connection, the hard disk drive also makes possible the storage and streaming of information for multi-disc games, so elements from early on in a title can be quickly recalled and incorporated into the action. But Sony has more on its mind than gaming when it comes to the future of the system. 
there's going to be a variety of things that uh, everybody can do, whether it's uh, you know, exchanging information, uh, whether it's text-based information, perhaps uh, voice-based information, messaging, um, and, and sharing a lot of different data. At this year's E3, Sony described the PlayStation 2 as being not just about gaming, but becoming the centerpiece of one's home entertainment system. And given their ownership of film, music, and electronics properties, their claim carries a lot of weight. At its heart, the PlayStation 2 still looks to be mainly about games. But when it comes to the future, we can rest assured it's anything but downhill. Yeah! Well, folks, we are finally here. It is midnight on October the 26th, and the PlayStation 2 is finally available for sale. Can't believe we finally arrived after all that wait, but no, it is here. And if you want to find out everything about the PlayStation 2 itself and the games available at launch, then come by the GameSpot TV website. All right, well, that's it for this current show, although if you think we're going home and going to bed now, you're totally nuts. So just for the moment, game, game over. over. Let's go. All Let's right. Go. When first sitting down with Serious Sam, a certain classic game may pop into mind. Yes, that game is Doom. The Croatian-based development group Crow Team has recaptured the frenetic action that first got our fingers twitching feverishly in 1993. There is one significant difference, though. Serious Sam looks much better. The engine is unique to the game and promises something we don't see often in shooters, sunlight and bright colors. Beyond that, there's some remarkable architecture and a host of some of the most inventive monsters we've seen in a long, long time. Serious Sam focuses on action. Creatures are thrown at you in large, unrelenting numbers, which forces you to use increasingly heavy firepower to hold them at bay. The compatibility test demo shown here has already fueled heart palpitations and a growing fan base. Look for Serious Sam in the middle of the year. We are looking forward to spending some serious time with Serious Sam. Now, our next title falls into the genre. Ever since Dolly the Sheep found herself with an identical twin, cloning has been a big global buzzword. Of course, it's illegal to clone humans, unless it's for games. Gamers have been able to create customizable skins for a long time, ranging from superheroes to cartoon characters. Making a skin of yourself can be a painstaking pixel-by-pixel -pixel process. 3Q has made it as easy as stepping into a photo booth. Technology created in Britain for facial surgery has led to the 3Q Clone Generator, an advanced digital scanning system that puts you right in the middle of the action. Want to get cloned? First, you step in front of the cameras in the 3Q booth. Digital Scanning Photogrammetry, or DSP, will then produce a 2,000 polygon, 24-bit scan of your face. You can accent your look by adding buzz cuts, facial scars, or even weight. Your clone is downloaded onto a CD, and all you have to do is install it into your game. The clone generator is compatible with Quake 3, Unreal Tournament, Half-Life, The Sims, and all games built on those engines. For 25 bucks, you can have yourself cloned at Babbage's in Dallas, Seattle, and San Jose. More locations are coming soon. Another year. Changing in the, in the Created by Cyan, now there's a new developer, Presto, working on Mist 3 Exile. When Myst debuted in 1993, it revolutionized adventure gaming. Interactivity and gameplay were taken to a new level. Myst is the top-selling game of all time. Riven was the successful sequel that expanded the look and scope of the Myst realm. The reins of the Myst universe have been transferred from Cyan Studios, who developed the first two games, to Presto Studios. Presto is hard at work on the third installment of the Myst series, Exile.
It's the same basic puzzle setup which we had in Mist and Riven, and people are familiar with that. It's a very simple interface, almost lack of interface really. Sort of click around the world, wander around, stumble across a puzzle, have that as a challenge, let that take you on. It's so amazing being able to pan around in these worlds. While animations are playing, you can still look around, you can still pan around. The story of Exile picks up 10 years after Riven ends. Atris and Catherine have moved into a new home, and they're trying to start a new life together and forget a lot of the problems of their past. The player's going to have to go through about five different worlds. The player's going to have to go through these ages and investigate the past and the story behind this villain in order to stop him from getting his revenge. Hello, Atris. An age is one of the environments in the game. And what we've attempted to do is to try to create as many distinct environments as possible so that the player has a real sense of traveling to a lot of very different exotic locales. For example, we have uh, ages that are completely organic where uh, all of the puzzles, all of the what would normally be mechanical devices are actually grown into the age. In order to create a distinct look for each of the ages in exile, design teams are grouped together by the age they're working on. Each team has a lead designer steering the vision of the level. The age I'm working on is an inverted tree. It's uh, the branches and the leaves are all inside the trunk. And this trunk of the tree is about 700 feet tall, 500 to 600 feet wide. We digitally shot trees and plants and flowers and that sort of thing and then went in and manipulated them to get our surrealistic effect. It's, I've never seen anything like it before in any game and I'm really pleased with those results because it's, it's dynamic. It's very, very dynamic. Mist games really are about the story and the interaction with the characters and we spent a lot of time uh, really focusing on that. I'm so glad to see you. We have live characters which look real in worlds which look real and you put the two together and it's very difficult to make a distinction between what was you know the whole you know what is it is it live or is it Memorex you know was it CG or was it or was it real people in addition to seeing characters and backgrounds the player will also hear impressive new music composed for the game ambient music in Mist and Rhythm was groundbreaking. The main ways we tried to improve on it were to do an orchestral score for the cinematics and to maybe give a few other pieces of music to tell the player they had accomplished something major in the game. Now that the game is coming together and every single person I show it to, when I see the smile on their face as they start to look at it, it balances out with this incredible sense of, oh yeah, I think we got it. I think they're really going to like this. Mist 3 Exile will be immersing players starting in April. Now, Wolfenstein 3D was a game that turned many a casual gamer into an addict in a matter of hours. And it also helped establish the highly ubiquitous first-person shooter genre. Well, at last Springs E3, we got a sneak peek at the follow-up, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, which is due out later this year. So to whet your appetite, we thought we'd show you our interview with Drew Markham, the game's creative director. Castle Wolfenstein was the game that started the first-person shooter. It was arguably the first game to sort of let you move around in the first person, which means looking out of your own eyes as opposed to seeing a character. And nothing short of revolutionary as far as that goes. I mean, everybody just went, wow, what's this? This was just such a leap in, in the amount of visceral experience that you got in that web. I'm here. I'm actually in this room. And I remember several publishers telling me, this is a fad, you know, this, people aren't going to want to do this. This is good. This is like a couple of years and these, this will all be over with. And it's just like, no, no, this is a firm genre now. This is its own thing. When we uh, started the design process for Wolfenstein, uh, the, the, the biggest thing that we wanted to carry over was fun. And that was the thing that people seemed to have the most in the first game, a good time. This return to Castle Wolfenstein is almost kind of retro in a way. I mean, it really kind of harkens back to that sort of golden age of the first-person shooter, even with, but having all the freedom that we have with the engines now, which is, you know, to be able to look up and down and have vast expanses. But it's about fun. The plot basically centers around 
Himmler and the SS and a lot of sort of fictional divisions of the SS that didn't really exist but that we've built an occult division that we have, a paranormal division, the uh, genetic scientists and their desire to uh, basically create something, a power, an evil power under their control that will spell complete disaster for the Allies and the free world. We have the, the Nazis able to pick up grenades and throw them back at you. You throw a grenade at them, they'll pick it up and they'll throw it back. First and foremost, this is a single player experience. That's the main thing that we want to have be really, really, really great is that you can sit by yourself in a room with the lights turned down and the sound turned up and get